Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you to everyone that's taken part in the poll just now. Will the Indian economy enter recession this year because of the corona lockdown? Uh, about 70% of you say either definitely or probably. Um, let's see uh, what uh, all the attendees think at the end of this session. Maybe we'll all be more optimistic. Maybe we will be less so. I hope Um, my name is Pratik. I'm one of the advisors at Bridge India, and uh, I just want to give a quick intro, and then I'll hand over to Spriha, who's our chair for the session today. Uh, this is part of an ongoing webinar series we've been hosting over the last few weeks. Um, uh, in normal times, we used to do two or three uh, physical in-person meetings uh, in London and elsewhere in Europe every single month. But clearly that's not possible now. Um, and we've, we've all embraced the, the world of the internet and, and Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, Bridge India is a think tank that's about a year and a half old. We are um, uh, based in London and the aim is to help what we call India watchers in Europe better understand India uh, with all its nuances, whether it's to do with economy, uh, society or uh, the political atmosphere. Um, uh, Today's session is on the economy, but tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. BST, so 2.30 p.m. Uh, India time, we have a session on uh, the space sector in India. Um, next week, we have something on ESG investments, so uh, environmental, social, uh, uh, governance-related investments. And then after that, we've got pretty much a session every week, um, including one on how uh, China and its Belt and Road Initiative might be seen in India uh, after this COVID-19 COVID lockdown uh, that's coming up in the last week of May. So that, that's enough for me. Uh, if you have any questions for the panelists throughout the session, please either feel free to message me um, or to Spriya directly and we'll take it up from there. Um, I'll switch off my video now, uh, but I'll hand over to Spriya and we'll get on with the rest of the session. Thank you all. Thank you, Prithi. Good morning and afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be hosting this panel. Uh, my name is Priha Shravastav. I am the executive editor at Business Insider in London, overseeing the London newsroom. Um, and with me, we have a great pan you know, panel of very interesting, very interesting names. Something that we, you know, we sort of, we've been thinking about this for a long time um, of how coronavirus is impacting the Indian economy. Um, we are in all, we are all in this together in terms of how the coronavirus is impacting the world economy, but then it's sometimes good to take a step back and look at how individual economies, individual countries are dealing with this. And today we are talking about India. So I'm going to introduce our panel first, um, and then we'll start with uh, introductory comments from our panel, um, and then go on with questions and answers. If you have any questions in the meantime, just feel free to send me a message or on Zoom or either on Facebook live where we are. Um, and we'll take it one by one. So our panelists, um, we have Dr. A. Didar Singh, um, who's former Secretary General Fiki and advisor to Bridge India. Um, we have Abhinandan Sekri, who's co-founder of News Laundry. We have Atul Thakkar, who's director at Anand Rathi Services. So between the three uh, panelists, we've got everything covered from media to policy, to reforms, to economy. Um, and it couldn't be better than this. We live in very unprecedented times at the moment. This is something that none of us ever imagined will happen. Um, the entire world has become a family, has become very close. And as we say in India, Vasudev um, Kutumbakam, which means the world is a family. That's exactly what seems to be happening now. However, um, in these times, the negatives are much more than the positive, unfortunately. Um, and it's start, starting from the rate of infections that are, is accelerating to um, uncertainty around the number of deaths and also uncertainty around how this lockdown will start to ease and our lives will go back to normal and what is normal and how our country is dealing with it. So without further ado, I would like to request our panelists to make introductory comments on what they think is um, the current situation and how the Indian government and the Indian economy has responded to it. So I'll start with Dr. A. Didar Singh. Um, so if you would uh, kindly tell us a little bit uh, from your experience and how this uh, situation is evolving and what, what, what is next for us. Thanks so much uh, for, for uh, having us all here today. And a wonderful thing that Bridge India is doing this, uh, this very, very exciting, very nice uh, webinars on a continuing basis. 
before I get into the really India situation, let me just look at the macro picture. Though, of course, you mentioned that everybody knows about it. I think it's important to just remember that if you look at the world GDP, it used to be $85 trillion, $85 trillion. And we had a growth of you know 4%, 4.5% around the world, which was actually happening. And now suddenly you have this coronavirus situation and the entire world economy is plummeting downwards. And you say that it's, you know, that there's talk that it's going to come down to 1% or maybe even 0% is what is being talked about. If you look at the India situation, you will see that whereas IMF is talking of 1.9% as, as growth for 2020, there are others who are even talking in terms of a 0% or 0.2% growth in the, in the Indian economy. So it's something which is pretty serious for economic reasons. And you've all read about it. You've seen it. You've seen, you've noted about it all, all over the place. The question for us now is really to look at how we can actually do, get a recovery from here. Now, first thing on this recovery part, I want to just mention it. This is my view, of course. My view is that for all pandemics before this, there has been a V-shaped recovery. That means you all go down and then you suddenly go up. Now, I hope that that also happens in this case. And if that were to happen, then the business models will remain the same. That's my view. That in terms of structuring, in terms of governance, in terms of the way the corporate sector is functioning, in the Indian economy, as in the world economy, you will see a retention of existing business models, as you will see of global models and country models will basically remain the same. But there is something here that we need to understand we need to understand, and this is a point that I make very often, this is a recession which has not been brought about by market forces. So it's not like the Great Depression. It's not been brought about by market forces. It's been brought about by governments who've imposed lockdown in different countries around the world. Now, if governments impose lockdown, which of course they do because it's very much required. It's a, it's a health issue and it's a life issue. So it has to be done. But the fact remains that if you look at the social compact that we have with governments, this also means that governments also have a responsibility to ensure that the economy comes out of the world lockdown. And this is the reason why around the world, you're seeing a large number of stimulus or relief packages being announced by a large number of governments, including UK and of course, India. In India, of course, we, we've uh, presently uh, talked in terms of 1.9% uh, trillion rupees, which is only 0.8% of our GDP. And there are economists who are now talking about this actually being at the level of 5% of, of GDP is, is, what being, is what being talked about. But if you look at this, we'll have to look at agriculture, manufacturing services. All three have to be looked at separately and seen in which area any of them can actually impact and, and really get on with it. So if you look at the future of the Indian economy, what we are talking about is really reform, reform, and reform. That is really the only way we'll be able to get, get on to the back on the rails and really get our, our economy, economy going. There are several advantages, of course, that India will have. And, and as I'm sure that many of you have read about it in terms of the China advantage, in terms of the FDI advantage, in terms of our large internal market. All these are well-known factors and they will come into play. But we have to understand that to be able to do this, we have to actually get out of this present corona phase. And to get out of this phase, I, I look at it in three phases. I look at the first phase, which is the lockdown phase, which we are all part of at the moment. The second phase is the graded opening phase. And the third phase, which is the really one that we are looking at in terms of economies, is really the post-vaccine. The post-vaccine meaning not only the discovery and the availability of vaccine, but everybody around the world actually getting it. Now that's going to take a lot of time. There is some people are saying by September it'll be ready. Well, Indian companies are also working on it, and we hope that by the end of the year something will be available. But subject to that, I do believe that we will get back on the tracks. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Singh, and thank you for sticking to the time. Um, I'll move on to Atul now. Um, Atul, with your background, um, I, I'm very interested in understanding how you think that this entire uh, COVID-19 um, you know, pandemic is going to play uh, on Indian, India's economy. I mean, we, uh, India, is, India as, a, as a country, uh, you know, we, we are still considered as part of emerging economies. So how do you think that India is going to deal with such a massive economic crisis? 
I think you're on mute, Atul. Thanks, Bridge India, for uh, uh, inviting me, and uh, it's fantastic to you know interact uh, in these times uh, when sometimes you are yourself feeling very lonely. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone, whether you all are in uh, Europe or in India. Uh, I hope, firstly, that all of you all are safe. Um, from the economic perspective, if you look at it, uh, and uh, you know, in specific for the Indian markets. Um, uh, let me tell you, I have seen probably uh, all the uh, bear markets in the last uh, two decades, uh, whether it is the uh, tech bubble, the financial meltdown of 2007, uh, 2008, 9, uh, European debt crisis, uh, and its relevant impacts on the However, uh, I must say that the current situation is like you uh, add up all these uh, economic problems that were there in the last two decades and uh, put a multiplier 2x 3x you pick the number uh, and uh, you know uh, it because right now nobody has a, a overall uh, number what is going to be the impact of the on the indian economy of it so you just put a multiplier of it and that will be your individual guesstimate to start with which simply means that um, it is uh, cash is going to be the king for a long, long time to come. And uh, you, you need to take a call as to where you are spending, whether uh, on your personal or on your corporate expenses. And how will you in, uh, be able to grow? Um, and uh, just to pick on the point where uh, uh, Dr. Didar was saying is that this uh, uh, meltdown is what we are seeing in our markets is that this will be probably seeing a multiple phases of uh, W curves rather than the V shape. Uh, so we don't expect this to be out uh, very soon as, because as he rightly said that even if the, uh, uh, the vaccine is detected by, uh, if you get the vaccine by September, uh, it will take a long time before everybody is injected the vaccine and all are immune to this. So, which means that uh, while we are in a lockdown in uh, India and globally, uh, according to various restrictions, uh, it's going to take a long time before um, uh, these uh, lockdowns are just going to get over for once and for all. There will be several such curves of lockdowns coming up. If I just step back for the Indian economy, four years back, uh, and uh, you know, every alternate year since 2016, Indian economy has seen something or the other, whether it's been the demonetization in November 2016, or, uh, you know, in August 18, we saw the island FS and the financial market uh, uh, cash flow crisis, um, and which followed up with a couple of uh, large NBFCs going bust, a couple of banks going bust. Uh, governments, government would have done whatever they could but um, the point here is that uh, that has weakened our economy to a certain extent. Uh, if you look at the FII and FDI numbers uh, of the fund flowing into India in the last five years, on an average, we have been doing uh, roughly $40 billion in terms of FDI and roughly um, $9 billion in terms of FII money coming in. But if you look at the first quarter of FI20, that is from Jan to March itself, uh, we have seen an outflow of $16 billion in the FII money alone. Now, which means that two years inflow is washed out within one quarter. And, and still, you know, uh, we don't know how far it is going to go out. Uh, go ahead. Um, uh, there are companies which are sitting on huge cash. They are looking for bargain deals. Uh, banks are... Are, while, while RBI has kept his window open, banks are, are confused whether to lend or not. And they, they are um, in a situation that uh, we may face a large chunk of NPAs and, and hence they are worried. They are coming out with newer and newer models as to how to evaluate um, you know, lending. Um, now, now this, everything may sound a lot bearish, uh, but uh, you know, let me put, let me, let me, uh, you know, draw a leaf from uh, 
the great Warren Buffett, uh, you know, uh, Berkshire Hathaway had its CGM just 36 hours ago, and I was uh, fortunate enough to listen it online. And uh, uh, he gave, uh, you know, a point where he said that um, Dow Jones uh, in 1950 was at two, and today it is closer to 24,000. So it's a 10, it's a 100x return which Dow Jones have given for a developed economy like America over the last 70 years, which have been at a constant war with other nations, uh, which is like a 7% 7 uh, 7 compounded return, uh, you know, which, which tells me something that uh, this phase will pass. Uh, the economy will definitely revive, whether it is F520 or 21 is, is something that will also depend a lot more on the policymakers. Um, Thanks, Atul. Yeah, money is fall, flowing a lot in the country, and that is a good sign. And I will I will pause uh, at this stage and thank uh, you. Come back later. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Atul. Uh, Abhinandan, I would like to bring you in at this point uh, to give your introductory remarks, but also hear from you um, what the government's response has been um, through all of this. Abhinandan. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for this putting this together and inviting me. Um, first, uh, I will, you know, in one sentence say, I think the government so far in India has done pretty much nothing. Um, and that is rather um, discouraging because the scale of the crisis we're looking at, I don't think has even been communicated to the people in general. I would say the news media is to blame um, because it is still not apparent to most people, even people who are considered relatively more educated, what is the scale of the crisis we're looking at the, as far as the economy is concerned. Now, before I go into how bad it's going to be, uh, I just want to point out one uh, you know, presentation that Ruchir Sharma of Morgan Stanley has put out. I think he's, uh, of the last three decades, he has this presentation where he shows not just the growth uh, figures, but also the stock market figures. The rate. India has not been an outperformer in the good years or in the bad years. So as far as emerging economies go, the world trends, what the world trends are, India is a bit above the best as far as the you know growth figures are concerned. And in bad years, it is a little better than the worst of emerging economies. So it is not that we are going to be outperformers one way or the other. Now, I, I'm just putting that in context of historically, that is where we are. Now let's look at where Indian economy was pre-COVID crisis. Newsroundly.com, there is a piece by Vivek call and I can you know give you some of the numbers from there. As far as auto sales were concerned, we had already started going down. They fell by, car sales fell by 23.6% to 16.95 lakh in 29-20. Two-wheeler sales, they fell by 17.8%. Tractor sales, they fell by 14.1%. Commercial vehicle sales, they fell by 28.8%. The revenue earnings from the rail freight, this fell. You can go on to all finished steel consumption fell, non-food credit fell. All this is before the coronavirus hit us. You can go on to the website and see all the numbers. Now, at a time when the rest of the world was performing pretty well, the developed economies, we were still doing that badly. Now with corona having hit us, can you imagine the scale of the slowdown or unemployment, or lack of domestic consumption. In an express carried piece yesterday on MSMEs, their, you know, their, their uh, how much they contribute to GDP, 11 crores are employed by them. There is no package announced for them as of now. There is nothing. I personally know of several people who've started laying off. They held through March, April, they started laying off. Um, so that is happening even as we speak. People are going back. Now, the, uh, you know, the issues that the media uh, ignores also kind of lull us into a sense of this is not one of those. And like Dr. Singh said, it's not a V-shaped recovery. In fact, it is a rare case where the prescription or the solution is going to be a problem in the sense that in other um, crises, you start putting, you know, you start spurring consumption. Here to spur consumption, you have to get people out there. The moment you get people out there, they fall sick. So you're on the catch 22. 
do you revive consumption at the risk of having a healthcare crisis that our healthcare infrastructure is not able to handle so that is the context we are operating in in this context right now apparently you know a day or two ago there was a meeting in the finance ministry to figure out what happens to the msmes now if you go by a report in times of india today the lockdown has delayed the peak by a month we would be heading the you know hitting the peak sometime in the second week of may but now we'll probably hit it in june now imagine if lockdown hadn't happened we would be in the peak so we are close to the peak and yet there's been no announcement by the government on msmes on a bailout if you see america you know the uh, uh, payment protection program now there are criticisms there are a lot of leakage a lot of people who don't deserve those you know millions of dollars are getting it but that is an acceptable cost to pay to make sure the economy doesn't grind to a halt we have done nothing of the sort not a single rupee has been spent from the pm cares fund at the same time we are charging laborers who are going back home for ticket sales when the railway has donated 150 crores for the fund now do you think these guys will come back and here uh, do i have another minute or am i over yeah just one more minute to go abhinandan go for it here i'd like to come to the most important point the confidence in the government is the biggest driver of growth or consumption or economic well being if you think all this labor that has gone to the villages is going to come back in a hurry well then we have to reevaluate human behavior the confidence in the government to solve the problems is at an all time low the trust in the government is an all time low people don't want to download the aroge setu app i'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing but india is unique i heard the bbc podcast yesterday they said australia has an app like this you know lots of european countries have an app like this but the only one that they mentioned that you know people are reluctant to download is in india why right. because people don't trust the government okay i'll have to stop you there abhinandan and we'll come back to you again um great introductory comments from everyone thank you very much i want to go into the economic bandwidth now of india um and dig a bit deeper into it um so i want to understand what options does india have to deal with something as big as covid-19 the recession risks the, so we've seen big developed economies coming up with massive stimulus packages which are also falling short you know like rounds and rounds and rounds of tranches that comes from the us the uk um and it's still ongoing um and these are these are countries that are strong not just in terms of fiscal policy but also monetary policy we don't we haven't seen a lot from india we are seeing but we do have to see a lot more what's the, how is india capable of dealing with a crisis like this and what's the economic bandwidth um, of india at this stage so i want to bring maybe start with uh, atul and then um, you know make my way to um, dr didar singh and abhinandan after that so atul can i bring you in first sure thank you um see i'll tell you uh, india is facing uh, some of the unique challenges which probably the west will not and and as rightly mentioned by uh, you know dr didar and abhinandan uh, with regards to healthcare system etc uh, we have to look at it that our investment grade right now is just a notch above getting jumped so if we slip significantly on the fiscal side and there have been the rating agencies are hounding already the government so when you are you know at that situation what are your options one option that us did is that they they went out by buy, uh, buying corporate bonds now our rbi or the government will not be able to do that it's going to be very difficult so as an option the government should look at uh, allowing not just psus but the uh, but the triple a rated uh, corporates to issue corporate bonds to the retail public and give a tax holiday on those bonds as in uh, for the investors you know this will be a very marginal dip into the uh, uh, government's tax coffers but what will benefit over here is that today if i'm putting my money in the bank i'm getting 3 and 1/2% in savings and i'm getting 5 and 1/2% in fd and the bank is not even deploying that money by giving loans to the corporates i might as well you know if i have the risk appetite i go ahead and and take the tax uh, tax free bond corporates several psu banks did it in 2008 uh, psu entities did it in 2008 and 9 and uh, they are 10 years 20 years bonds and and uh, you will at least start seeing the flow of liquidity this this could be one of the uh, pointers i'll pause here thank you um adul um dr didar singh can i bring you in for your comments on that please 
Sure, uh, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll just mention here, you know, you talked about and you, you were asking what are the options available before government? What could have yes. been possibly done? Now, in my opinion, there are only two options. Option number one was herd immunity. You know that in the UK itself, they tried that and they've, they've done it in, in, in several other smaller countries and South Korea has done it rather well. Uh, Japan is doing it. Sweden is doing it. Now, this is possible in smaller countries. It was not an option for India. With 1.3 billion people, you can't expect to have herd immunity, which will require 60 to 70% of people getting first infected. That means 700 million people getting infected. Now, that's not an option. Number two, the option was to open the economy or keep it going and not go into lockdown. That was the second option. Now here, I think it's not India which needs to be singled out. It's entire Asia needs to be singled out, as does parts of Africa and even South America. How is it that these countries have a lower rate of infection than, say, Europe or, or the USA? It is because they came after, the Europe, after Europe and USA, and they took the advantage of saying that irrespective of what happens to the economy, we will first preserve lives. You know, the whole quest, whole issue of lives versus livelihood. This was a conscious decision. And please remember that it's not only India which has done this. We have the same situation in Bangladesh, the same thing in Nepal, the same thing in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand. They're all following the similar policy of putting lives before livelihood. Now, there is, I, I agree with what Abhinandan said, that not much has been done on the economy. Well, please remember that we are a poor country. We don't have the kind of resources which are available. Yes, there has to be more packages announced. I totally agree with you. But more than even the packages, I believe what, what you heard me mention earlier on, it's really reform. We need reform, reform, and reform. That is what is really actually required in terms of actually managing to get our economy back on the track. And I do agree with, with, with Atul and, and what Abhinandan was saying. It's going to be a long time. It's not going to be something which will happen overnight. We are in a major, major economic situation where there is a downslide and recovery from it is going to take, take quite some time. In fact, there was a very funny one. There's a funny cartoon today in uh, the latest Economist, and I'm, I just relate it because I think it's of great relevance here. You know, China is the one example of a country which has gone back to economic activity. But the funny thing with the going back to economic activity that it's only 80 to 90 percent of the original activity. And what is that little 10 percent which is missing? So it, this cartoon in, in economy shows the whole plane, which is in perfect shape, except it doesn't have a tail. Now, that's, you know, that's the kind of situation we are in. You can recover the economy back, but if you don't get the entire ecosystem going at the same time, you're not going to be able to manage to actually bring it back and fly with it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, Abhinandan, your thoughts, please. So a um, couple of things. One is I completely agree with Dr. Singh that the government had no option. I mean, I don't think there's any question that a lockdown was necessary. It was the only option. Also, although Sweden, Dr. Singh has claimed that they never went for herd immunity, they've denied it. They said that they just went for an arrangement where they would, the economy wouldn't come to a grinding halt while they would kind of maintain social distancing. But yeah, I mean, that may be because the PR disaster of, of their uh, herd immunity, but that's absolutely true. Uh, but here's the problem. You see, um, uh, I see a comment that there is a, that the, uh, I have confirmation bias that the trust in the government is an all time low, whereas data suggests otherwise. Data only suggests uh, Mr. Modi's approval ratings let nobody be under any illusion that means trust in government. So I think the, 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 the people think that because is he doing a good job? Yes, he's doing a good job. Do you trust the government to take care of you financially? No, we don't. Both are not mutually exclusive. Both thoughts can coexist in a mind. Now, uh, as far as recoveries are concerned, and I agree with Mr. Singh, we don't have the kind of resources that, like uh, I have mentioned this on a, you know, um, I was on a discussion on a television channel. I have a friend, he has a few hotels, you know, one in UP, uh, one in Delhi, NCR, uh, one in London. His hotel in London, 80% of his salaries are being paid by the government of Britain. Here he's expected to retain all 900 staff across three hotels. He says, I may do it for a month or two, I'm not going to do it forever. But Britain, I'll do it. Now I understand we don't have those kind of resources. The first uh, paycheck protection program package that was announced by the US government was $350 billion. And that's just the first. I don't know how many more they'll announce. We can't do that even in the total cumulative figure. However, 
I think there has to be a communication that look, this is the extent of the problem we're looking at. This is what we are doing to address it, whether it is food. Now, I'll give you a simple example. The government is the primary source of solving problems for a citizen. I can tell you about NCR because I'm involved in some of these efforts. Most of the food that is being fed to people who don't have any is being fed, done by NGOs and organizations and private citizens who got together and are you know, putting dry rations to different places. In fact, we've got an article about this. Uh, Indian Express had a piece that in, I think they, they looked at 12 states that 60% of the food that was being fed was being done by NGOs. And these are the same NGOs whose life has been made miserable over the last five years. Whether it is FCRA regulations, whether it is de-recognizing them, whether it is making it impossible for them to get money. Today, they are the ones doing the feeding. The government is not. Let's be clear about that. So right. there is a trust deficit. And just one point, this yep. is a unique economic crisis because, you know, like Atul said and, and Dr. Didar Singh said that, you know, earlier there was thing about V-shaped recovery. Earlier, the economic shock was a pure economic shock. This is not a pure economic shock. It is a lifestyle shock. So there are certain industries where it could be a V-shape. But certain industries like the airlines industries, I think in the foreseeable horizon, there is no recovery. Not for the next four or five years. Whereas some industries, you may see a recovery as early as next year. So this Thanks, is a Anand. unique economic shock where every industry will have a very different trajectory of recovery. Perfect. I'm going to pick up a few questions that I'm getting from audiences before we move forward. I mean, and then I think this one's, uh, well, it's for all panelists, but I'll start with you. It says, how do the Indian car sales in India pre-COVID compare with global numbers? Might be good to have a context for comparison. This is from Ram Shankar. It's for all the panelists, but uh, I mean, and then if you want to start maybe because you gave a little bit of uh, overview earlier um, and yeah. then we'll go on to the other panelists. Thank you. Let's keep so, it brief though. So, yeah, so, so Vivek had done a piece before the one he said, in fact, I would uh, highly recommend that people read all Vivek calls pieces. He's done some fantastic pieces across uh, news organizations, including ours. I don't have a comparative of the car sales the world over and us, but I do know in the US, because Mr. Trump would never tire of saying it, car sales were doing pretty well. Auto sales are doing well. He says, because of me that we have got a recovery even in auto. So I don't have the data here, but I know... India, year-on-year -year data, it fell lower, but uh, maybe I can ask Vivek to do a comparison across the world. Maybe he'll do a piece on that. Any other panelists wish to add to that? I, I'll just add to that. Um, you know, if you see the April month data that has come for the car sales, uh, pretty much India has been at zero for all companies across the world. But if you even pick up, you know, m, &M uh, which does some bit of an export, uh, has seen a 60% dip in their sales uh, globally, but let's put it this way that at least they could manage to sell 40% of the cars. At least there is some activity happening. So uh, from that perspective, if you look at it, uh, we, we have been hit uh, far more significantly, uh, both on uh, obviously on the health side as well as on the economic side. I'll, I'll just add only one little point to this. You know, when you talk of car sales or any sales for that matter, we're actually talking of demand. Demand in India has gone for the simple reason that people don't have the economic wherewithal to manage that demand. Whether you're in the hotel industry or in the auto industry or, or any other industry or you're an informal sector, you today do not have surplus cash mm -hmm. to create any kind of demand in the market. And that's really the issue. And that's why... I guess we need this incentive or stimuli or relief package even more to create that demand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next point from Martha Kotlarska, and it's, this is something that I've been sort of thinking about as well, that COVID is also a big chance for India because it, we've seen how trust in China is starting to, uh, this trust deficit with China as well, the perception has changed a little bit. Um, is, this a time, is this a time when India should literally just jump in and sweep and you know, try and uh, become this very attractive destination for manufacturing for companies? I mean, Make in India has been a big campaign, but is this India's chance to be able to do that? Dr. Didar Singh, can I start with you? Yeah, I would say the answer is a plain and simple yes. It's a very simple reason for it. You know, capital is always looking for good economies to go to. They will not go to battered economies. Today, the, today Europe and the USA are battered economies. So they will look to, to Indian economy, they look to Indonesia, they look to Thailand, they look to places which are not so badly battered 
in terms of COVID and linked to the, the whole economic situation. But to be able to guarantee it, I think we are back to the same old situation that Atul and Abhinandan were also mentioning. This slowdown of the Indian economy didn't happen only because of COVID. It, it was beginning to happen even before that. And the reason for that is a plain and simple reform agenda. Unless you don't have very good changes done to the regulatory environment, to the settling, and let, let's look at a simple thing like contracts. Contracts in India is difficult to impose because ultimately the courts step in. This is beyond government. The courts step in and rescind contracts. I mean, look at look at what happened to so many of these highway projects and all, all over the place. So contracts becomes a major issue in terms of ease of doing, not just ease of doing business, but ease in terms of running business. That's where the real issue is and will be an issue even so far as FDI is concerned. This opportunity that China is affording, it is definitely affording an opportunity, but it's an opportunity where you might see the people shifting to Vietnam and Bangladesh as they have been doing earlier rather than come to India. So to make it happen and make it come to India, we really need to get our act together. Right. Thank you. Right. Atula, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. I would like to come over here. Um, you know, I second what the uh, doctor is mentioning that uh, reforms is mandatory for getting the manufacturing. If you look at the data of last two years, uh, the companies actually from China and this shifting from China was happening since almost 24 to 18 months from now. Uh, there have been at least uh, 80 to 100 corporates who have shifted out of China uh, in small or big way. Uh, we have been uh, able to, you know, get only uh, less than 10% of those. Most of them have gone to other Southeast Asian nations. Uh, key three, uh, you know, uh, reforms are needed. Uh, they are needed in the land. The, you need land reforms, you need labor reforms, and you need a steady corporate policy with regards to taxation laws. Uh, a flip-flop on all these three, uh, which has you know, uh, the agenda of all political parties, irrespective of whosoever it is. You know, you come in and you you tinker around with that, and and you just uh, you know uh, push the uh, reform movement and you push away uh, the investments in India. So that that is the priority which has to be done. Right. Thank you, Abhinandan. Yeah. Um. I think um. Of course, the the two points that uh, Atul and Dr. Singh mentioned are absolutely. Uh, imperative and every government and everyone says it, every commentator says it, it reforms, reforms, big bang reforms, big impact reforms. These have just become words now. It's become rhetoric which never gets anywhere. But specifically, uh, there is one more element which I'll come to later, but when it comes to reforms, I would like to say that there is a sense of, um, in India, things don't work as per contract, like Dr. Singh said. And the data suggests that, in fact, in the Mint, there's a piece that, you know, even the improvement on our ease of doing business was on account of two parameters, but on the other parameters we did badly among them was contracts. Um, uh, and I think one of the reasons why we, and I mean, I'll give you a simple example on paper. Now you can, you know, form a company in India in seven days or eight days. It's come down from 11 days. Uh, I registered a company last year. It took me 20 days just getting the name approved because now you do it online. They say, no, this is too general. This is too this, this is too that. Like they rejected 15 names. So, and there was no real reason. Then we said, okay, you tell us what we should name our company. Then they sent us a list of names. You just picked one of those. I'm giving you, I mean, I can give you bigger examples, but I mean, that'll take forever. There is a serious problem in the perception, the media management and the reality of doing business in India. And the second thing, which, you know, just like the environment, which was just put off as an externality and didn't really show up in your accounts or in your balance sheets was the damage to environment. These are costs till about two decades ago, they were just this ambiguous externalities and they weren't taken as costs today. They are, I think one thing that is, you know, kind of seen as an externality right now, but will show up in balance sheets in the coming years is how safe do you think, or how inclusive do you think a country is that has a direct impact on economy. When you have video reports, when you have office holders, when you have people who are sitting in positions of power, elected representatives saying, if you're Muslim, you cannot come into this neighborhood. Muslim traders will not do this. It does have an impact. Now it is not quantifiable right now, but things like this, just like environmental damage will show up in balance sheets going forward. These externalities cannot be ignored and India 
is in the Saudi Arabia League as far as that is concerned right now. I'll tell you. Thanks, thanks, Abhinandan. Oh, we are, yeah, we're getting lots and lots of questions. Uh, Sorry, Supriya, yeah, may go I on. just come in here for just a, just a second. Go on, you know, Abhinandan is correctly saying that the word reform has become you know much used, and everybody talks of reform. But there's a slight distinction I want to make here. I'm not talking about deregulation. I'm talking of reform. Deregulation has happened since '91. All the stuff that happened since '91 was deregulation. It was not reform. Real reform is what Atul was talking about: land, labor, capital. If right. you do the reforms in land, That's an important capital, distinction. Yeah. That is when you actually going to get reform. And yeah. that I think all governments have shied away from. They've not had the the wherewithal to manage it. Maybe for political and other reasons, but that is the real reform that's required. And when you see, uh, you know, European countries or America or Canada or anybody managing it, it's because they've done it on land, labor, and capital. Right. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, we've, we're getting some really interesting questions. So, uh, one from Sumita Sa uh, Singha um, says India's economy is largely informal, almost 80%, and highest in Southeast Asia. Many migrants have been sent out of. Uh, sorry, I missed that there. Um, have been sent out. She basically wants to know how, how do you decide what the migrant population is? How do you um, make that distinction? Um, and how do you, how do you um, say that, um, you know, what is the status of a migrant? How are they determined? Why are they being asked to pay their train fares to return? And what is the impact of this on the Indian economy? Um, so I'm going to leave it as a free discussion. Whoever wants to jump in. Okay, I'll, I'll start with migrants since I work in the area of migrants. Uh, you know, migrants move for economic reasons. They don't really move for any other reason. And if today they are being compelled to go back, nobody's sending them back, nobody's forcing them to go back, but if they're compelled to go back, they're going back because of economic reasons. They don't have jobs anymore. They don't have a job anymore. So, and so if you don't have a job, you don't have food. And I agree with Abhinandan that NGOs are doing a fantastic job. Yes, if it wasn't for NGOs, in fact, that's a silver lining in this entire situation. If it weren't for the NGOs, we'd really be in a, in, in a black room here. But the migrants, once they go back, again, the problem is going to be that, okay, they'll find a, a place to be and that they'll have their own home to be at for a while, but they will not have the economic wherewithal to survive. And in that situation, they're going to be looking for jobs. And if the economy revives, you will find, whether you call them migrants or you call them just labor, I think it's just labor around, around the whole of India, because India is one country, you will find labor going anywhere and every, everywhere, not really defined as migrants as such, but as labor looking for jobs. That is going to be the situation that you'll see happening, not just now, but you'll see it happening once the economy actually revives. Perfect. Um, um, anybody else wants to come in? Well, uh, to the best of my knowledge, a migrant is one whose permanent residence is in their, you know, document, whether it is in their passport or ration card or wherever it is, is one place and their, you know, their, 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 their place of current residence and working. Is... Now, when it comes to that, the data in, in India will be very sketchy because of the unorganized sector of, of uh, such a large amount of the labor that works in the unorganized sector. I don't know how credible that data would be or how much of it would even have. But um, this is, again, a crisis, I think, of trust, because, uh, because given the situation that played out in many parts of the country on when they had to go back and the panic that, that set in, uh, many of them, and I have seen news reports, there are some reporters are out on the ground speaking to them. They say, you know what, we'd rather starve to death in our village than starve to death in the city, because there, there is a social network. There is something. They say, here, there's nothing. So the way the lockdown happened, and here I will say, the lockdown could have been announced in a slightly less dramatic and more sensible fashion. It need not have to be this, you know, grand announcement that makes everyone, you know, stand up and say, oh my God. It could have been done in a way where all the stuff that played out later could have been organized a little better. I think it would have made the trust factor of the migrants to return to cities a little more palatable, even if the economy takes longer to recover. Perfect. Um, I want to now go on to international perception uh, of India in all of this. I mean, we're seeing mixed reviews. We are seeing things like international organizations slashing growth forecasts. We're also seeing Moody's looking to downgrade India. Um, you know, there is this whole foreign investor perception as well, whether India is a safe uh, 
investment hub as well now. And Abhinandan, as you mentioned, India is far ahead in emerging markets, but with the market volatility at the moment, and Atul, this is something that you can probably comment on as well, is is India a safe destination for investors? What's the perception that the international, uh, you know, what is the international perception of the way India is handling this? Um, and also if it is a, a considered a lucrative uh, investment opportunity for the rest of the world. Okay. Atul, so, can I bring you in first and then we can yeah. go on. So let's, look at, Thank you. so let's look at, uh, you know, the opportunities for any international investor. The West uh, or the, let me put it this way, the, the developed markets are either slowed down or they are already negative. And they are, they are there uh, in that situation since a decade. Uh, you have uh, the developing nations in which you know, China and India are, are the largest uh, two uh, populous uh, countries. And which means the consumer demand over here is going to be the maximum. Uh, China, given uh, its own um, political scenario, its own sketchy background, uh, people are always scared in investing in China. Uh, and hence, uh, you know, India becomes, comes at the forefront. Uh, it, is, it is the political angle and the, the, the cumbersome uh, system in India, which actually uh, creates problem for investments to come in India. I can tell you that uh, the, the, the quantum of investments that India can, can shore up uh, in this situation, in the current market situation, uh, can be even, uh, you know, probably 5x of what it is right now. So you look at the data. I'll, I'll go by data. 2008, uh, we were seeing uh, close to a couple of billion dollars uh, coming into our country on a regular basis. And post the uh, financial crisis, uh, we saw that uh, jumping up to as high as $10 billion on an annual basis. And, and this has happened over a period of time. So it's, it, uh, and, and as you uh, come out from this economic crisis, the first that you will see is the large corporates. Uh, the listed companies which will start seeing investments and then it will trickle down to the uh, unlisted and the MSME. But definitely India is going to see uh, quite a, a bit of investment. Uh, if there is policy intervention, it will only help. So you're very hopeful of this. Yes. You seem to be uh, painting a very optimistic picture. <laughs> That's my bread and butter. <laughs> Abhinandan, I want to bring you in. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit skeptical, so I'm going to bring in Abhinandan at this stage. Yeah, count on me for the bad news. So, uh, <laughs> I just saw your poll. I think it's almost 65% of the people who polled think that our growth rate for the next year is going to be um, between uh, 0 to 1.9%, 1 if that's what it says. Yeah. So, so, so apparently Moody's, Moody's also said that the India's growth rate will come down from 2.5% to 0.5%, which is a massive right. growth um, I uh, think if forecast. we can step up zero, it'd be fantastic. Because I mean, even that, uh, I mean, there is um, suggestions that Europe is going to contract, uh, US is going to contract significantly if it hasn't already. I think last I checked their uh, unemployment insurance claims were up to, I think, 3 million or 3.5 million. Um, so um, it's going to be bad. Uh, I think um, as far as the world's perception is concerned, I do think India has some huge assets going for it when it comes to becoming a manufacturing hub or a hub for countries to come in here and set up factories or plants or offices or whatever it is. We do have that. Uh, I just think in India, uh, the economy is not an important political agenda item. And that is not true for any one government or the other. That is true for the state governments. That is true for the central governments, whichever party is in power. The people don't go out and win on these issues. Therefore, it is never, in, I mean, I'm not saying it's, you know, easy as apple pie, but it's not rocket science either to make a country like India an attractive destination, you know, like China has done. The only reason it doesn't happen is here other factors outweigh the economy. And that happens at every level, it happens at every government and it happens for every party. I don't think that's changing. Uh, I think right now all political parties still have their sight on what will make them win the election and the economy is not one of those items for any of them. Dr. Singh, I'd like to go to you at this stage and get your views on this. 
Yeah, I have I have a couple of points that I'd like to make at this point here. You see, in terms of uh, whether people will look at India or they won't look at India, here I agree with, with, with what Atul just mentioned. If you look at the global situation, there's really only China and India in terms of the two options which are available to them. In a situation where China is having this problem and China is being blamed for the coronavirus and various other issues coming out of it, you are going to have to be perforce, have to look at India. It's, it's almost like, like democracy. It's the worst, it's the best of the worst. It's a situation which may very well be prevailing in the sense that your options are so limited. If you can't go to the battered economies of Europe and, and the OECD economies, if you can't have, if you have problems in going to ASEAN, where are you going to go? You have to end up with going to India. Now, I do agree that there are lots of negatives. There are lots of problems in terms of, of how, you know, politically we handle it. Or, and I agree with Abhinandan that uh, it has not, I mean, the economy has never really been a, that important an issue in, in at election time. But the fact remains that at the end of the day, employment or money in your pocket is an important issue. And coronavirus is showing it even more. COVID is showing that unless you have this surplus in your pocket, you can't even survive. And therefore, it's going to be necessary to bring economy on the front of the agenda, even if it was usually kept at the back. And I think this is a great lesson that we're learning from, from COVID, that, okay, we manage in a slightly different manner, but we learn to manage our economy better, because unless we do that, we will not be able to provide the employment that's necessary to keep the economy and to keep our population going. Thank you. Dr. Singh, Dr. Singh, there's a question for you from Sarabjit Kaur Sidhu saying that you it's interesting that you describe US and Europe as battered economies. Could you expand that on that a little bit and just talk about why you think they are battered economies? Well, Abhinandan just, just mentioned it. They, they have a growth rate of below 0%. If you have a growth rate of below 0%, you are a battered economy. It, the, the problem is not just that you have all the surpluses with you. The problem is that your day-to-day -day activity and your day-to-day -day production is now down in a very, very major manner because of the coronavirus. Now that has impacted these, these two economies very much more than it has South America or Africa or Asia. So you are going to have a problem of understanding and therefore of looking for this. And you know, let me make this last point, which is, which is very important for everybody to understand. You see, we keep talking of finance all the time. We keep talking of NPAs, we keep talking of banks. But just remember that there is always surplus money in the market. You have pension funds, you have sovereign funds, you have many capital intensive activity happening around the world, which has to find a place to go. And unless you find this place to go, you yourself as an, as an investor and you yourself as somebody who's taking part in the markets and, and Atul will, 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 will uh, give you more information on this. You have to go somewhere. And in that going somewhere, probably India is also going to be one of the issues or one of the countries that you will look at. And we've seen this in the last four or five years that we've had more FDI coming into India than we had in the last 18 years before that. So this is something which is kind of positive. Thank you. Yeah, Sri, I would like to add upon what Dr. Singh said is that yeah, sure. he's, uh, you know, he's saying bang on target. I mean, if you look at 2008 and nine, and I'm going again and again to that because that's the closest you know, which has been the biggest uh, economic uh, crisis that the, the world has seen. The, the quantitative easing, which was announced by most of the development, uh, developing, uh, developed countries, uh, all the money actually flew, uh, came into the emerging economies, like India. And, you know, when you, when you get a, a quantitative easing uh, in US, uh, you know, uh, it takes time for them to invest in their own economy. So the first is they invest in the markets globally and India is one of the market uh, where they will come and invest. Now, if the quantitative easing this time around is a multiplier of what has happened in 2008 and 9, you can just imagine the quantum of money that will come in India, provided we act sensible as, as a country, as policymakers, and, and we attract uh, you know, a large chunk of it.
Perfect. I want to quickly jump on to testing capacities now and talk a little bit about where we are in India with that. I mean, we are seeing, seeing more and more countries start to ramp up testing capacities. In the UK as well, there are about 100,000 uh, people being tested regularly now starting um, last week. Um, I want to be able to understand where is India in all of this? And to, I mean, we see limited number of cases in India right now, and there seems to be um, sort of an appreciation of the fact that it's not spreading in India, but is it because there are the testing capacities in India are really, really low at this moment? Um, and that's the reason that we are not able to see the right numbers. Um, I want to pick your brains on that and I'm happy for anybody to start on this. You know, I'll, I'll just mention to you here that yes, it is a fact that, that uh, it is being talked in, in global media a lot that India's testing is way below par, that we are not testing the amount that we should be testing and the WHO itself said, testing, testing, testing at one point as, as, the, as the real sort of way to get the real mantra to, to handle this issue. But it's very simple. We are a poor country. You cannot test 1.3 million billion people. It's, it's virtually impossible. The, the testing has been limited to only those that show some signs of it. So maybe it's, an, it's a skewed testing. And it is limited mostly to government labs, to government laboratories, to government hospitals. Yes, it is a somewhat skewed that you're seeing, but at least you're getting the information. The information is completely transparent. Every day it is hosted. Everybody knows how many have been tested. Yes, we've not done the general kind of testing which is necessary because we don't have the money to, to do that kind of testing and we don't have this fast testing kits yet available. Today's testing takes 24 to 48 hours before a result is given. So this is an issue, but it's something which I believe is the same as the lockdown situation that we were compelled to take uh, as, a, as a strategy in this country. So Thank you. I'm just, yeah, I'm just trying to get the latest testing figures. Uh, the last I checked, which I think was day before yesterday, uh, Karnataka had done about 65,000. That's all of Karnataka. Delhi was at 45 or 46,000. Um, but there were yeah. certain other states which were like in the single thousands, which is really low. Right. One uh, reason, of course, is uh, like Dr. Singh said, that we don't have the financial resources. Uh, but that is not the only reason. And I don't want to get into the politics of that. There has been, um, uh, the Home Ministry has very strictly kind of funneled who gets to test how much. Can you, you can't import, states can't import testing kits on their own. They have to go through the center. And the center will decide how, you know, whether they can get that delivery right now or not. So um, I'm not sure what the reason for that is. I mean, maybe there is a valid reason, maybe there isn't. But the reason we are not testing enough is not only financial. That is the first part. The second part is, uh, I think Governor Kumar in New York had done this random testing of 13% uh, it came up. I think he had done, I don't know how many uh, yep. hundred thousand tests and it appeared. And these are, uh, you know, non-symptomatic cases. Yep. So the data showed that 13.2% of New York, which, they tested between the ages of 19 and 60, had COVID and they didn't even know it. So he says- Which are the out, biggest risk, uh, which are the biggest risk category because they're asymptomatic, they don't really carry any symptoms. And he said, if I were to extrapolate that data across the country, there are millions walking around right now with COVID. Absolutely. I do think that is the case here as well. I think we are not testing asymptomatic cases because as it is, there's a shortage. So the last thing you do is test asymptomatic people. Um, but what kind of impact that has, I am not a public health expert or a medical expert, but I have spoken to a few uh, and, I, and they say this is an evolving kind of equation. Uh, one doesn't know how big the impact is going to be. There is still no clear sign. Does the heat dull the virus? Does it make it less potent or not? Some say yes, some say no. Is it, you know, an immunity, this thing that India hasn't seen the kind of numbers that we've seen in the West? Is it because our old people don't socialize as much as the Italians and the Spanish? There are so many variables. I'm just, I can just say we can thank God that we are right now in a relatively better zone. But, right. the, but the health aspect of this is, is still an open question. I don't think anyone has clear answers on that. Okay, perfect. We're running out of time now. So I have one last question before we go to closing uh, comments. Is the media in India censored? and keeping all the COVID-19 uh, impact and the, the, the sort of impact that we see, the numbers that we see, very simple question, is the media censored? And I think I want to start with Abhinandan here. So uh, I, I would like to uh, say uh, this is not a yes or no question. It is like, is India democracy? Yes. 
Is Switzerland a democracy? Yes. Can 50,000 <laughs> people in Switzerland sign a petition and change the constitution? Yes. Can 50,000 people in India do that? No. Can 5 million do that? No. Can 5 crore do that? No. Can 100 crore do that? No. But one notification, you know, in, in, in the parliament can make things happen, which may or may not have popular support. But as far as the media is concerned, I don't want to get into the politics of it, how good or bad it is. I will just give you a simple example. And this has to do with revenue models. I don't know whether you saw two or three days ago, the newspapers asked the government for a bailout. Now with manufacturing being the way it is, who are the top advertisers in for media? Who keeps media afloat? I mean, not news laundry, because you know, I was taught always plug your product. Newslaundry.com says pay to keep news free. When the public pays, the public is served. When advertisers pay, advertisers. So we don't survive on advertising. We believe the news model is broken when it survives on advertising. I was watching television today. There was an ad of the Chhattisgarh government. It was like a 90 second ad of telling English news watchers what they are doing for their Hindi speaking labor. It has no relevance, but that is the revenue that there was hardly any ad of any company, usually Hero, Honda, Tata. These are the advertisers, auto, mobile phones, none of those. Today, the government has become time, the advertiser. Today, if you see the Times of India, page five has a full page government of Bihar ad telling English news consumers in Hindi what all they have done for their labor, like I care. Right. Right. Okay. Now, now, if that is your model, if that is your news model, I will leave it to the wisdom of your listeners <laughs> to decide whether it is uh, whether it is censored or not. And at a time when government was just one part of your advertising, we saw how compromised it was. Now, when right. only government has the money to support you, well, we'll see what they do. Perfect. Um, Mr. De Dr. Didar Singh, quickly comments from you and then we'll go on to uh, closing comments because we're running out yeah, of time okay. now. Uh, on, on, on the media one, I think more important than the fact of whether we are censored or not censored is the fact of where media is in, in, our, in our country. And uh, there is a lot of social media, there's a lot of print media, there's a lot of television media, there's all kinds of media. And I think the vibrance of India is that we have such a variety of it all the time. Some of it is good, some of it is bad. All that is part of the cake that we have to learn to eat and, and, and manage with. In terms of the overall situation, I, I think I've, I've sort of given my points already and I'll just end by saying that this is a major crisis. Yes, at a global level, at a macro level, it is a crisis, but it's a crisis that I believe that we will get over and the basic business models will not change. You will still have the corporate world, you will still have the stock market, you will still have the, the boards of directors, you will still have governments and you still have parliament formed in the way that it does at the moment. All these issues will remain because the global governance structure will remain the same. The only things which will become important, of course, are the social distancing, wearing masks, stuff like that, and the climate change issue, which is definitely upon us. Thank you. Perfect. So we will bounce back. Um, Atul. Right. So I would uh, reserve my comments on media censor because I sort of uh, agree with what Abhinandan is saying. Uh, and uh, I'll just leave at that. Uh, closing comments, I would like to say that um, you know, you may or may not agree with the government, uh, but, uh, and, and definitely reforms and policy is required, uh, and it is an ongoing thing. But right now, as a citizen, what can I do uh, is what we all need to think. Um, can I, can I uh, invest and have confidence and invest in my, my, com uh, my country, in, in my markets, uh, rather than... Uh, you know, sitting at home and just taking the uh, fixed, fixed deposit route. Can I go and donate to an uh, uh, NGO who is really doing fantastic and, and help them so that, uh, you know, uh, I don't need to keep relying on government to support uh, the, the, the poor and the migrant labor. Can, can I uh, go and, and, and uh, support the medics? If, if I am a techie, can I do something which is... Uh, uh, something which is more techno savvy and which can help my country. That is what which we all need to do right now uh, and introspect while we are all sitting at our home uh, and are fortunate enough to have uh, at least a shed of our own. Uh, compare that with the migrant laborers who are actually on the road. Thanks, Atul. Abhinandan, closing comments from you. Well, I... Any ray of hope? 
But there's always a ray of hope. I mean, <laughs> if you have no hope, then you should not be in the news business. Uh, I think I, 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 I will say that I, I echo what Atul says. And, uh, and, and I have seen a crisis like this. People who I have agreed with, disagreed with, coming together. And I have seen a socially conscious side of people who I did not know had a socially conscious side. And I think that is fantastic. Uh, I will say just one thing uh, in closing, the fact that Mr. S Dr. Singh and Atul reserve their comment on media censorship tells you the level of censorship. Uh, people are even afraid to think things uh, and, and let and people be under no illusion. But I, I, read, I saw an interview of Brett Stephens. He's a commentator and a columnist for the New York Times. He's a conservative a columnist and commentator. And uh, he had a very interesting thing to say. I never really thought of that from like a historical perspective, he said the Great Depression gave the world a Hitler and many such autocrats became popular because of the Great Depression, because of the economic consequences of the Depression. Um, I mean, he explained it a lot more eloquently. It led to people saying, I will solve your problems because there was that, that neediness of the Janta to say, okay, this guy will solve a problem. And it was not just Germany, across the world. He says, time will tell in a time where populist, uh, you know, uh, uh, leaders with yeah. tendencies of, of an autocratic nature are in power all over the world. What will this give the world? So I think great. that's something we should all look at and uh, historians yeah. will, uh, will talk about it. That's great. Very interesting closing thoughts. Well, thank you very much to our brilliant panelists. Uh, this has been very, very interesting. I really enjoyed moderating. I still feel like there were loads of questions I had, but we always run out of time. Um, special thank you to all the attendees and all the questions that you've been sending. I'm really sorry that we couldn't get to all of that, um, but I'm sure that our panels will be available if you, know, if you want to reach out to them directly or if there's anything else. Also, if you guys have any uh, suggestions on any more webinars that Bridge India can host, any more topics, then please get in touch with Pratik, myself, or the Bridge India team. Um, and yeah, that's a have a great day. Thanks again, everyone.